so this sermon is Father Matt's sermon. How are we to understand Christmas? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. How are we to understand Christmas? What is more, how are we to respond to Christmas? On April 12th, 1961, the Russians put the first man into space. That man was Yuri Gagarin. Nikita Khrushchev was the premier of the Soviet Union at the time and said, when we went into space and the heavens, there was no God up there. In response, C.S. Lewis wrote an article called The Seeing Eye. And in it, he said this, if there is a God who created us, you couldn't find him by going up into space because God does not relate to human beings the way a man who lives on a second floor relates to a man on the first. How does a man on the second floor and a man on the first floor find each other? Well, the man on the first floor just goes up and there's the man on the second floor. But Lewis says, if there really is a God who created us, he wouldn't relate to us like that at all. Instead, he would relate to us like Shakespeare relates to Hamlet. Because you see, Shakespeare is the author, the creator. And he created Hamlet along with Hamlet's entire world. Therefore, Hamlet and the characters in that world could only know about Shakespeare if Shakespeare were to write some information about himself into the play. You see, Hamlet can't just find Shakespeare by going up into the rafters of the Globe Theater. No. The only way he's going to find anything about Shakespeare is if Shakespeare writes something in. And therefore, Lewis says, the only way that we are going to know about God is not by going up into outer space. But if somehow God were to reveal himself to us. Lo and behold, that is what the Christmas story is all about. How are we to respond to it? Three ways. One, we must hear well. Two, we must make peace. And three, we must fear not. So first, hear well. We see this emphasis on hearing in a couple of places. In verse 10 with the shepherds listening to the angels. And in verse 18 where it talks about those who listen to the shepherds. But we also see Mary hearing well in verse 19 where Luke says, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. What is going on? Luke is giving us a model for how we all need to respond to the message of Christmas. Well, why is hearing an issue? Hasn't everyone heard the Christmas story? Ah, but here's where we encounter a problem. Have you ever had someone tell you something only later to find out that you didn't listen very closely? I greatly struggle with this issue. Katie will tell me something or warn me about some event that is coming up, and I will hear what she is saying. I will even acknowledge that I hear her, but then guess what happens later? The thing that she talked about to me will come up, and I will say, I don't remember hearing that. Do you see? I didn't hear well. That is, I didn't pay attention, I didn't focus, and I didn't think out the implications of what was said. This is what Luke wants us to avoid. And so in this passage, he shows us the right response. And if we listen well, we will find two very important lessons. First, 
Don't miss the ordinariness of how the word of God comes to most people. Notice that the shepherds got an angel, but everyone else, they just got a shepherd. Shepherds were not the elite people of society. No, they were just ordinary people. I think a lot of us would prefer hearing from an angel or having God come to us in a burning bush. But those are extraordinary ways that God speaks to a small number of people. But the rest of us get a book. A book that we can very easily overlook and not pay attention to. It's, it's hard. How many people say to themselves, January 1st, I am going to start reading through the whole Bible. They usually die somewhere around Leviticus 3. Why? Because it is difficult. You have to pay attention. You have to ask questions. And you have to go back and reread. And it is not easy. But even more than that, second, like Mary, we are to ponder and treasure God's word. The Greek word used for ponder here is more of a cognitive word. It means to put in context or connect, to ask, how does this connect to the rest of my life? So you're not just hearing, but you are making connections with your life. What are the implications of this passage for my life? Whereas this word treasure has more to do with the heart. Because to treasure means to keep something alive, like keeping a fire alive by feeding it, or a plant alive by watering and nurturing it. So here we see the need to understand God's word mentally, but also the need to nurture it until it takes root and grows. Again, we must not underestimate our ability to disregard God's word. Jesus tells us this in the parable of the sower. It is not enough just to hear God's word. No, we must treasure and ponder it. Otherwise, its valuable seed might just fall to the wayside and we along with it. But second, besides hearing well, we must also make peace. This is what the angels proclaimed in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Here is the main idea. When we grasp God's grace, we will experience God's peace. If you don't have peace with someone, what do you have? You have strife, discord, enmity, war. This is what we all have with God until his grace comes into our hearts. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, when was I ever at war or strife with God? I might not be passionate about God or paid attention to him, but that doesn't mean that I'm at war with him. But Paul says the natural mind is hostile towards God, Romans 8, 7. You see, you will not be able to understand yourselves, let alone our world, until we understand how our hearts operate. In the book of Romans, Paul teaches us that our hearts are in rebellion against God. He says that the irreligious person overtly asserts his or her independence from God by saying, I am not going to follow you. I'm going to live how I see fit. Meanwhile, The religious person covertly asserts their independence from God by saying, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to follow the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to do all these things, and now God has to answer my prayers and give me a good life. Why? Because we think we can control God and make him owe us. In other words, we are showing that we don't trust him. Ironically, the irreligious and the religious turn out to be doing the same thing because none of us enjoy the fact that we are not in control. And we are all deeply committed to the fact that only if we are in charge will we be happy. 
Paul says that the mark of a real Christian is they will come to recognize this hostility. Not only have we done bad things, but even the good things that we've done, we've done for the wrong reasons. Therefore, the Christian says, I need to be saved by grace because even my good deeds were done with the wrong motives. And when we begin to think and act like this, we will begin to enjoy the peace of God and our warfare with him will be ended. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced this peace yet? When we have this peace with God, we will then be able to go out and experience peace with others, which is exactly what Christ taught in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Christians of all people should be known for this because we know how to admit we are wrong. We know how to forgive, and we know how to reconcile. We know how to do this because of Jesus Christ. It's the message of Christmas. Thirdly, fear not. Verses 9 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Why were the shepherds afraid? When the messengers of God appeared. Because when God shows up, people become terrified. Why? To understand why, we must go back to the Garden of Eden. When God first created us, and before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God, and they had no fear of him or anything at all. Now, just think about the things that we become afraid of. Rejection. Failure the future. But what we find in Genesis 1 and 2 is that no such fear existed. You see, they had a perfect relationship with God. And if we had that kind of relationship, then we would know that God was in control and we would trust him and we too would be without fear. The reason we are afraid and the reason why we worry and become anxious is because we don't trust him. If we had a perfect relationship with God, we wouldn't fear rejection or failure or the future or even death. Because we would know that regardless of what happens, we will be with him forever. But of course, when Adam and Eve sinned and turned away from God, when they decided to be their own masters and to be in control of their lives, what's the first thing that came in? Fear. And that fear persists to this day because the venom that poisoned Adam and Eve has spread to all their children. And we see it in our desire to be in control, to be captains of our own souls and masters of our own fate. Now we are afraid of rejection because of getting our worth and value from God. Instead of that, we have to earn it from others. And if we don't constantly get love and affirmation from others, then we die. And we become slaves to what other people think. And we become slaves to our ability to perform. And we are driven by fear. What is more, we are deathly afraid of the future. Why? Because we can't control it. And that is why we all get freaked out when bad things happen around us. And like the shepherds, we are filled with great fear. It's not a coincidence that Adam and Eve became more afraid when God shows up. In fact, all throughout the Bible, anytime God appears and his glory is revealed, people become terrified. It's not like a sci-fi movie. When aliens show up and everyone is just transfixed in wonder. No, when God appears in the past, people either die or they run for their lives. The best way that I can explain the situation is through illustration. Imagine if you are impersonating a medical doctor. And then a real medical doctor shows up. You would freak out. What is more? 
If there were a medical emergency, the cat would be out of the bag because you would be exposed as a fraud. We think we are in charge. We think we are in charge, that we are in control, but deep down, we all know that we are frauds. We are not in control, and we are desperately afraid of being exposed. We're afraid of failure rejection, and the future. But when God comes near, we become terrified because his glory dwarfs us. His beauty shows our ugliness. His power shows us our weakness. His love shows us our hate. And we can't take it. And so our lives are filled with great fear. And here the angel comes and says, I've got the solution. Do you know what it is? It's Christmas. Because what he says in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Which means to the degree that we behold the things he's telling us, to the degree that we see them, to that degree, these fears will be removed. And what are those things? A Savior is born who is Christ the Lord. If we want to get over our fears, we need somebody to save us. That person has been born, and that is Christ the Lord. This title is breathtaking because it is telling us two important truths. First, Christ was a term given to God's anointed one who would be God's instrument to right all wrongs. But second, Lord which is taken from the Hebrew Tetragrammaton. This is Yahweh. So this person born is both the human Messiah, but also God in the flesh. In other words, God has written himself into human history. And this is the true message of Christmas. And if we understand it, it will drive away our fear and fill us with God's peace. Speaking of God writing himself into human history, this is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. And not just him, but we see this truth in one of his friends, Dorothy Sayers, as well. Dorothy Sayers was the first woman to graduate from Oxford. She was a writer of detective mystery fiction. And by her own self-assessment, she wasn't particularly attractive. Her most famous novels were about the fictional character Lord Peter Whimsey. He was an aristocrat and also a detective who solved impossible mysteries. She wrote many stories about him, and about halfway through the series, a new character emerges. It was a woman by the name of Harriet Vane. Harriet was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford. She was a writer of mystery fiction, And she wasn't particularly attractive. Well, she and Peter fall in love in the story. They solve mysteries together, and they get married. Some Dorothy Sayers scholars argue that Dorothy looked into the world that she had produced and the man that she had created, and she fell in love with him. And she wrote herself in because he was lonely And she solved his problem with herself. And they lived happily forever. Now, some of you out there are thinking, oh, that's a sweet story. But do you realize that the claim of Christmas is infinitely more wonderful than that? Because Christmas means that God looked into the world that he created. He looked at us and the mess we were in, and he wrote himself in. And he came into the real world as Jesus Christ. And he didn't come just to embrace us, but to die for us. That baby in the feed trough is God in the flesh. He gave up his glory so that we could receive it. He lost his peace so that we could enjoy it. He was kicked out of the inn so that we could dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look at what he did for you. Now, won't you trust somebody? who did all that for you? Why can't you trust him with your future? Why can't you trust him with your life? If he did all of that for you, you can trust him. 
So do you see what the angel is saying now? Do you want to stop all of the fear? Then behold, look at Christmas. Look at what God did for you. And to the degree that you behold it, grasp it, treasure and ponder it. To that degree, those fears will start to diminish. Fear not and behold. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the work you have done in our lives and in the world to make a way for us free of fear and open to peace. Help us to love you and see how you've written yourself into our own hearts. Amen.